Ushuaia, Argentina, is situated on an island at the southern tip of South America and is a dropping off point for the many ships that now sail to the Antarctic Peninsula. After our flight down from Buenos Aires to join our crews, we had some free time to take a look around town. Ushuaia is the capital of the province of Tierra del Fuego and being situated below the 54th parallel south latitude, it is often referred to as World's End. It has a reputation of being cold, wet and windy, but if you are lucky, you may catch it on a sunny day. Ushuaia's population is now nearly 80,000. But due to its isolation, many efforts have been made over the years to secure permanent residents to help establish sovereignty of the province. During the 1880s, many gold prospectors came to Ushuaia following rumours of large gold fields, which proved to be false. In the early 1900s, it was established as a penal colony for dangerous free offenders and political prisoners and modelled after the colony at Port Arthur in Tasmania. The forced labour of the prisoners became integral to the building of the city. In more recent times, the Argentinian government has declared Tierra del Fuego as a tax-free zone to encourage more people to settle there. There are several tour companies and shipping lines running tours to the Antarctic Peninsula. The ship we were travelling on was the MS Roald Amundsen of the Hurtigruten Line. The Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen was the first to successfully reach the South Pole back in 1911. And though we weren't going that far south, we felt it was a good omen. The Polar Class 6 ship had its maiden voyage in 2019. It is capable of carrying just over 500 passengers and features hybrid power technology. Our cabin was a standard one and we found it suited us fine. There were no inside cabins and all cabins had at least a window. After leaving New Swear, it took two days crossing Drake's Passage before sighting the South Shetland Islands and the peninsula itself. On the second day, we were treated to the spectacle of Smith Island, with its ice-covered peak jutting out over the ocean. And then there were the whale sightings. The weather was fine and sunny, so we took advantage of life on deck while we could. We are now in Antarctica. Uh, I don't know if you can really tell. Visibility is pretty, pretty poor right now, but of course we are, yes, surrounded by a beautiful ice pack on all sides. Suspense is probably killing us, but when the conditions clear, when the haze opens up, I assure you, you will be floored by the spectacle of this landscape. The weather did clear, and we were straight into our first landing. The shuttle service of the Zodiac soon began. A limited number of venturers only permitted on land at any one time. We were all wearing our weatherproof jackets, which we now owned, and the rubber boots, which were supplied. Wearing of the heavy rubber boots for landings was mandatory. 
Once in the zodiac, with the mothership receding into the distance, it suddenly hit us that we were here, and it was actually happening. It's quite easy. You take the steps. I strongly recommend you to use your left hand to use the handrail. And if you want to take a walking pole, you can take some. Once on the ice, we had to stop a moment to take it all in. Two huts were at Damoy, one British and the other Brazilian. This one, it was built in 1973, but it started operations in 1975. The other one, the Argentinian, uh, it was from 1953. And the last group in this one, 1993. Here you can see the British flag. So basically they are, they are just coming now to do some maintenance from time to time. Some of the group took the option of sleeping out on the snow. Could be fun, but not a great idea if you know you have to get up during the night. So that they felt really isolated, we moved on to another mooring spot. After remembering to pick up the overnight campers, we sailed onto Orne Harbour to see if it was okay for another landing. Unfortunately, it was a no-go as the cove used for landings was iced in. On our way to our next option, Argentina's Base Brown, we sailed through the La Mer Channel. This narrow channel, with its sheer walls of rock and ice and eerily still waters, had everyone out on deck with cameras clicking wildly. landing at Base Brown looked promising as our ship manoeuvred into its mooring position. This landing was to be the first time that we set foot on the Antarctic continent itself, a milestone for us and many others. Established in 1951, Elmeranti Brown Antarctic Base is named after an Irish-born seafarer, William Brown, who later became Admiral and Commander-in-Chief of the Argentine Navy. 
The base served as a permanent research station from 1951 to 1984. It was one of the most complete biology laboratories on the Antarctic Peninsula. In 1984, the station's original facilities were burnt down by the station's doctor when he refused to spend another winter there. He and the other station personnel were subsequently rescued by the USS Hero. Although the base is still operational, it is pretty well taken over by the penguins. Up to this point, all the penguin colonies we had seen were of the Gen 2 species. Daylight seemed almost continual, so no matter what time you looked out of your cabin window, there was something interesting to see. The cruise in the Zodiacs was scheduled for the next morning at Danko Island in the Herrera Channel. This was definitely one of the highlights of the trip. Our guides steered us through floating ice and past some amazing iceberg formations. And the hole gets bigger and bigger because the tops of the arch start to lean on each other. You see how the iceberg is melting and there's raindrops? Oh, yeah. Yeah. At times, it was hard to know where to look.
from Danko Island, we left the Arara Channel and headed for Nico Harbour, located in Anbord Bay. Here, a sudden rumbling noise brought our attention to a snow slide high on the rock face. <laughs> the Gen 2 penguin species is most closely related to the Adeli and Chinstrap penguins. The Gen 2 is easily recognisable by the broad white stripe across the top of its head and its bright orange-red bill. They are the third largest penguin species after the emperor and king penguins. They are especially adapted to extreme cold and harsh conditions and are the fastest underwater swimmers of all penguins. They can dive as deep as 200 metres and sometimes swim as far as 25 kilometres out to sea, which can tire a fellow out. Gentoos breed monogamously, and infidelity is often punished with the banishment from the colony. Nests are usually formed as a circular pile of stones. The stones are jealously guarded and are often the subject of noisy disputes. The stones are especially prized by the females. A male penguin can often obtain the favours of a female by offering her a choice stone. The gentoos lay two eggs which take 34 to 36 days to hatch. The skewer is a predatory seabird. They will often steal eggs from penguin nests and are also known to kill young chicks. They don't appear to have any fear of humans. The landing at Port Charcot on Booth Island involved a climb up to a cairn, but for some intrepid travellers it also involved an icy Antarctic plunge. The resident penguins wondered what all the fuss was about. As we stomped up the hill in our rubber boots, we could see one of the kayaking groups going for a paddle across the serene waters of the bay. Although the cairn is only 50 metres above sea level, getting there felt like quite an achievement. The cairn was built there by French explorer Jean-Baptiste Charcot and his party during their 1903-05 expedition. Just behind the hill is what is referred to as an iceberg graveyard. 
the icebergs, possibly blown into shore during a storm, have been permanently trapped. We'd be looking out for other species of penguins, such as the Adelie and the Chinstrap, and we're lucky to spot a couple of Chinstraps down by the landing. Other memorable moments of the cruise included a visit to the MS Royal Amundsen's bridge. Facing the elements out amongst the floating ice in the zodiac. Meeting new friends and exchanging experiences. Being entertained by a member of the crew. And simply just staring out to sea and being mesmerised by the effortless soaring of an albatross.